Alright everybody, we are back with Napoleon part 2 of Oversimplified. Roger, or Napoleon, says hey. Not gonna lie, I dropped the ball on this, guys. It's totally my fault. Um... No excuses, I should have done this like weeks ago, but uh, we're finally here for um, part two of Oversimplified's Napoleon, and um, I kind of feel like I did this backwards, you know, I feel like I should have watched this before I did the um, Epic History TV Napoleon series, but you know what, um, I think there were some things in part one that I feel like Epic History might have like just kind of brushed over. So there were a little tid, you know, a few tidbits here or there. That said, um, I think it's good in a way that I watched Epic History's, you know, series first because now I have like a lot more context for um, Oversimplified's version of Napoleon, which is, you know, if I had watched this first, then I probably would have been pretty lost <laughs> because they do do things very, very oversimplified. They leave a lot of context out for the stuff that they, you know, put in their videos. So, um, I feel like, you know, I just have a little bit better understanding of, um, of, uh, this version of Napoleon than I would have otherwise. But before we jump into part two, I do want to do something that I like to do, um, on my channel when we do these multi-part series, and that is to go back and review a few of your comments from part one. Just like to highlight um, some of your comments, some of the stuff that you guys have taught me down in the comments. And uh, if you don't want to watch this part, it's not going to take too long, but if you don't want to watch it, you can click the uh, reaction chapter and go straight to that in this video. But, let's do comment time. I only have three comments because I feel like uh, most of your comments were just about kind of these three points. So. Um, first comment is from Derpy Nerdy, <laughs> and he says, Man, seeing your reaction on the gu guillotine made me question myself on how I got used to so much graphic stuff. Well, you know, I know uh, a lot of people aren't very squeamish about the guillotine stuff. I am for some reason. I don't know what it is. And below his comments, some people were like, yeah, we learned this stuff at like 11 years old in school. We did, I did too. Like we, we learn about the guillotine in history. It's not, this, it wasn't brand new to me <laughs> in, in these videos. Um, I just, I don't think I've watched a lot of videos about it. Like I've read a lot about it. I've seen it occasionally in like movies and stuff, but I can't stand to watch that. I just can't stand it. It's so morbid to me. Um, I don't know. For some reason, I would rather watch somebody in front of like a firing squad than getting their head chopped off. I don't know, it's just like, uh, it's gross. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, it's just how I personally react to it. I know a lot of people don't have problems with it. That's totally fine, but just know, any head chopping stuff, I'm probably gonna like turn away from the screen because I just, I can't, I can't deal with it. Can't deal with it. Um, next comment is from Crown Prince History. Uh, he says that the country was Hanover. Now there was like a, a random part of, I guess, Germany, what would now be considered Germany, um, that was red, that was associated with the UK in part one. And I was like, what is this random little bit over here? Why is it technically like part of the UK or whatever? And um, so he says the country was Hanover, uh, what I've, which I've heard of before, um, whose kings were also the kings of England. Hanover became independent. However, when Queen Victoria became queen, and uh, since Hanover did not allow women to rule, Hanover was given to her uncle. So, okay, so I guess the same royal family ruled over both, but they kind of had to split up the rule because, uh, I don't know, like, what, what's the deal with Hanover? You guys don't like women ruling over you, which I guess was normal back in, I guess the UK was, was the UK, like, basically one of the first countries to, um, have women kind of rule over it? Like, wasn't there, like, some ancient queens, though, too? Like, in Egypt, I believe, there were some ancient queens. So maybe the UK wasn't the first, but I think it definitely was, it seems to be, like, a little bit more progressive than a lot of other countries in that sense, that it has been accepting of, of women 
ruling for quite a while, it seems like. Our next comment, our last comment, is from AJ1978. Now, I was really confused uh, about how Napoleon came from a uh, family of nobility, but they weren't necessarily like rich or whatever. I think Americans associate nobility with wealth because we don't understand how <laughs> monarchies and nobility and all of that stuff works. It's different over here. Like the class system is totally different and we just, it's not the same as over in Europe. So we don't really just, we just don't have the same sort of understanding with, with this stuff as you guys do over in Europe. But AJ, uh, 1978, let me know that being nobility doesn't mean you're rich. It just means that you belong to a certain family. There was plenty of nobility in Europe that was deeply in debt. That said, Napoleon's family wasn't exactly poor by the standards of the time. They had enough money to live uh, comfortably. However, that was nothing compared to the famous or massive fortunes of the you know major no noble families of France. I can't read. Um, who were the equivalent of modern billionaires? Okay, so... I guess nobility is more of a like a family status type thing than a wealth thing. So yeah, again, I guess it's just something I have to wrap my head around because we're just not we're not used to that really over here. Um, I guess we might have something similar to it, but it's it's just kind of done differently. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for letting me know about all of that stuff. Thanks for answering my questions down in the comments. Um, I did read through all of your comments, so. You know, stuff like this really helps me to kind of like fill in some of the gaps with these videos, so appreciate it. Okay, so we are going to be looking at part two now, and um, I don't know, like, uh, I think it kind of left off before Napoleon was about to like head into Russia, I think, if I'm, if I re remember correctly, so I um, just realized my computer is not plugged in, and that's going to be a problem. <laughs> Probably just gonna shut off in the middle of this. I don't want that. All right, it's plugged in now. Um, okay, so I think we're gonna we're gonna pick up somewhere around Napoleon's uh, foray into Russia. I already know how this goes, but uh, we'll see how oversimplified presents it. So let's take a look. After the Third and Fourth Coalition Wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent, and he was now undoubtedly the master of Europe. After the Battle of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river for negotiations. They had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like a house on fire. They laughed together, they chatted long into the night, they kissed. The two had a lot of mutual respect, and Napoleon even told his wife that if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. So weird. Kind of a weird thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, they came to an amicable yeah. agreement. Russia would lose barely any land, and in return, they'd join France against the UK and invade Sweden. Win-win. On the other hand, Frederick William III was sidelined, and Prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to French client states. Only the UK remained as the last major threat to Napoleon, and they continued to be a big thorn in his side, constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful navy to wreak havoc on French trade and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The British were safe across the channel. Well, he said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you with money. Earlier in 1806, Napoleon had announced the Continental System, a total shutoff of the UK from continental trade. But no the one in Europe care. was to trade with Britain. <laughs> And Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. The yeah, British economy hard. did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion, by going to Copenhagen and blowing a bunch of stuff up. But in general, the British managed to stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Many neutral countries found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place, as the two European superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy. Hey America, you better not trade with the French, Swore or else I'll come down the White House. This. What? This is gonna wreck my economy! I need to start saving money. How the heck am I going to start saving money? Yeah, that's right. You know where this is going. Making peace with the Russians, a continental blockade, and blowing up Copenhagen. Sick of being blown up for doing almost nothing, and under significant pressure from Napoleon, the Danish officially sided with France. But Napoleon's blockade had the biggest effect on continental Europe, who were now cut off from a major trading partner, one that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing empire. 
Hey, wait a second. So the Danish, they just lumped Danish in with Norway up here. So at this point, again, like I'm trying to, I'm getting acquainted with uh, European geography pretty quickly here because um, not only have I just gone through the uh, Napoleonic Wars where Europe was different than it is today, I'm now going through World War I. Um, I'm just starting World War I. And um, the geography is also different. So I'm trying to, I'm really kind of getting a bit of an education now on like the more historical geography of Europe. Uh, so stuff like this throws me. <laughs> where, uh, you know, he said the Danish basically decided to, you know, go against France here. Um, so I expect Denmark up here to be uh, Danish, obviously. I wasn't expecting Norway. Was Norway not a country at this point? I feel like this is a stupid question because somebody in the comments is going to be like, he just said Norway like five minutes ago, you weren't listening. Or whatever. Uh, that's usually what I get <laughs> when I ask these sorts of things. But, um, I don't know. You guys, please enlighten me on what's the deal with uh, Denmark and Norway up here. Cut off from a major trading partner, one that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing empire. And a lot of countries didn't fully comply. Portugal, a traditional British ally, refused to take part. No problem. Napoleon sent an army and invaded. But it wasn't just Portugal. Many of Napoleon's allies were also suspect. Your Majesty, it seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I'd beat them up. Do I even have any real friends? Are you my friend, Pierre? Say yes or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to mistrust his ally to the south. And in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting? Meanwhile, you let this ambitious nobody who dislikes me run the country. And you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife. And what's worth? Who the heck are you? I'm the king's son. I just overthrew my dad. So actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French Force. Okay, so I think I remember this uh, from part one now. I, rem I remember saying that the way Oversimplified is laying everything out, it's, um, it's kind of like making uh, or giving me a better overview of how all of this kind of worked than Epic History TV did because Epic History TV went a lot more into detail and it was split up into multiple parts, and so it was a little bit harder to piece together kind of like the overall story of what was going on. Um, I mean, I got it kind of in general, but here I feel like Oversimplified is kind of explaining this in a, in a slightly different way. And uh, because they are uh, concerned more with just the overview of what happened, um, they're giving, they're they're presenting that I think a little bit better than um, Epic History TV did. So uh, this like point about Portugal and stuff, um, you know, it's just one of those points in Epic History TV that probably got lost on me because it was mixed in with just so much other information. But now it makes sense, like, why Britain went down there because they were allied with the UK. And, like, I kind of got that from Epic History TV, but again, this just laid this out in a bit simpler way for me to kind of, like, see how all of these pieces are fitting together. So... Uh, so that is good. That, that's a good thing that I think Oversimplified is doing, is it kind of helps, you know, because it is presenting it in a slightly different way. Um, it is giving me a slightly different viewpoint of um, how all of this went down. It's and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French forces, many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, <laughs> occupied Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. All right. We're here with the royal family of Spain. So, Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I That's just think we're right. Well, I've got the test results right here. Fernando. In the case of the Spanish throne, what test you results? are not the king. <laughs> uh -oh. And Carlos, you are also not the king. <laughs> I'm the king. 
Actually, Napoleon made his brother the king, but for all intents and purposes, Spain was now his puppet. He expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power, least of all one who had previously attacked the Catholic Church. And so the, and so the people of Spain revolted. Brutal fighting broke out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across the kingdom, and vicious atrocities were committed on both sides. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies. But before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. The whole thing became a nightmare for the emperor. He excelled at traditional warfare, but this was something more akin to Napoleon's Vietnam. The whole conflict would keep hundreds of thousands of French soldiers and resources bogged down for years. Napoleon was never able to break the will of the Spanish people, and this problem weakened his position in Europe. <laughs> hey, Francis. Want to go to war with Napoleon again? Oh, I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. <laughs> well, okay. Seeing that Napoleon was now caught up in Spain and with some British funding, Austria decided maybe, just maybe, oh, this time, they'd have I was a chance. Like, I was like, who is he talking to? Uh, I was trying to figure out what country this guy was from, so Austria. Okay. So did they? No. Napoleon defeated them in just four months. It was quick but it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So this time, nope. the Austrians yourself, gave him a run Napoleon. for his money. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Still, Napoleon had yet again kicked Francis's butt, and as part of the peace terms, Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, however, Napoleon and Francis came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis's young daughter. But wait, doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes, he did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another, but now that Napoleon was playing the monarch game, he needed a male heir, and his aging wife wasn't giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, they felt that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. So through the marriage, Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. Between the failing blockade against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. But still, look at this map. So blue, so beautiful. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting chain of events, ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Marshal Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after oh, agreeing wait. to join Napoleon. Okay, so uh, I feel like I, th again, this is one of those things where you guys can be like, you weren't paying attention, <laughs> enough because your TV stuff. I, uh, I don't remember them mentioning that he changed his name, though. I thought, uh, which I guess it makes sense, you know, because the royal family there now, I think... The Carl, like the Carl name, that was like a whole big thing on one of my other videos about Carl and how that's like a, um, a Swedish name or something, um, or Swedish royal name. So like, I remember that whole like discussion. Uh, so I guess it makes sense that he would have changed his name because like the the Swedish royal family is still still has like that name to to this day. So makes sense. Uh, don't remember him, I don't, for whatever reason, I don't remember him changing his name. I didn't know he did that. Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after agreeing to join Napoleon's continental system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless string of victories. All he had to do now was sit back and not make any major miscalculations that could completely turn the tide of war. So let's see what comes next. Russia. Francis Francis's alliance with Russia was a terrifying prospect. 
Together, the two could have been unstoppable, but unfortunately, the alliance didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade. And eventually, they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alexander? But he kissed me. He kissed you? You wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. Okay, so... <laughs> so, uh... Okay, kissing stuff. Um, so this point right here also was a little lost on me in Epic History TV. Again, I know they made the point. I know they talked about it. But again, like, Epic History TV just threw so much information at me. It's gonna take me, like... You know, repetition a few times for some of this info to sink in. So, um, so I I uh, I knew that Napoleon had like this pact with Alexander and Russia, and then I know that Russia turned on Napoleon. But I, it was a little lost on me as to why that happened. Like, why did Russia switch sides? And this just explained it to me. It was an economic issue. Uh, due to the continental system and the blockade of uh, British trading with Russia. So that helps kind of cement that for me. See, I'm, I am getting some stuff out of this. Uh, it's a nice compliment to Epic History TV. You know, I recommend you guys, if you want to learn about Napoleon, um, you know, watch multiple, watch multiple uh, resources, or use multiple resources, you know, uh, relying on one series one channel on uh youtube one book whatever you're it really like for me to learn stuff it really takes me getting information from multiple resources and seeing stuff and reading stuff multiple times for it to finally like sink in i think that's normal i think that's how most human brains you know learn and work um so it's kind of cool like this is just kind of reminding me and reinforcing certain things that epic history tv already covered but again they're doing it in a different way so it's like coming into my brain from a different angle different viewpoint and so some of this is making better sense to me than the way epic history tv presented it so <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, made up of troops from every corner of his empire, and he prepared to invade. Okay, it looks like Napoleon's coming for us. Generals, I need ideas. We could stand and fight. No, that's stupid. You're stupid. We could run away. You. You're a star. You'll remember Napoleon's tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you. Scorched earth. If his opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he could not maneuver his enemy. And if he could not maneuver his enemy, I think you get the point. Napoleon launched his invasion and hoped for a quick battle, but all he could do was try to catch the retreating Russians while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. It's actually really brilliant when you think about it, and I think I might have also said this during the Epic History TV ones, because um, I, you know, I did, I did kind of understand this, but... Um, really brilliant strategy, actually, by the Russians. Not only are they scorching the earth, well... You know, the bad thing is you, you're, scored, you're ruining your country at the same time <laughs> as you're getting Napoleon to chase you further inland. But, I, you know, the other advantage to this that the Russians have is they're luring uh, Napoleon in and he's going to get stuck really deeply in, in Russian territory during the winter, which turned out to be, you know, catastrophic for, for Napoleon. So there are multiple uh, strategies going on here with Russia. They really outsmarted Napoleon on this. And uh, it's kind of impressive, actually, when you think about it. So as he went, the horribly hot summer devastated his army. His men died of heat, exhaustion and disease. This too. Supplies yeah. began to run out and his men began to starve. Many deserted and still the Russians continued to retreat. Numerous times Napoleon considered turning back. But that little voice in his head kept on telling him, keep going, just a little further. And don't worry, you're definitely average height for the time. He nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, he predicted the Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city without a fight. And he 
was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Borodino. The Russians fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. He launched a full frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. The Russians eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow to fall into Napoleon's hands. Quick, the French are taking the city. Release all these prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well, Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your oh, luck. I Moscow this. went up yeah. in flames, and as Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. But he had just defeated <laughs> such a Russian, like such a Russian thing to do. Just release the prisoners, let them burn the city. I don't know. It's just it's kind of funny, actually. The Russian army and taken their most beloved city. In his mind, he had won. So he sent Tsar Alexander in St. Petersburg a letter. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. Ever? Ever. But your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling supplies. If we don't say anything, well, then they'll all die. Oh! After waiting for a response for about a month, the first snow of winter began to fall, and Napoleon sensed the catastrophe that was about to unfold. He decided their only choice now was to get out. And that's when it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. His glorious invasion had just become a race for survival. As the Russians realized the French were fleeing for their lives, they began to close in on their supply line. Men froze to death, their horses as well. There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road as it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Napoleon, fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River, but a little Napoleon cleverness gave him the old Jeffrey Duke, tricking them into thinking he was going south and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges to the north. When the Russians realized where he was and began to close in, the French burned the bridges before everyone could cross. Hundreds drowned and thousands were captured. At this point, Napoleon got wind of plots against him forming in Paris, so he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining French stragglers made it across the border, it's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia. Less than 100,000 returned. See, I think this is, um, this just makes me think of like the difference between modern warfare that we have today versus back then, you know? It's kind of like why I feel like, I feel like humanity is always going to have wars, you know? Um, and I don't know. I just feel like it's in our nature to have conflicts and, you know, I, I, Hopefully we, we get better with it, you know, and don't have as many in the future, but I, I don't know. I just kind of feel like it's always going to, there's always going to be people in the human race who are power hungry, you know, for whatever reason, they're going to, they're going to go to war. And, um, you know, it kind of makes me grateful that today, you know, we have technology, like things are a lot more, you know, modern to where you're probably not going to be in this type of scenario in the future where you're going to get stuck, you know, 500 miles inland somewhere and, you know, be reduced to like walking to escape or whatever. I know at least for the U.S. military, like we would have um, vehicles and, you know, means of, you know, getting out of a situation like that relatively quickly, I feel like. Um, you know, I think most armies today do, but it's... You know, a lot of people will say, you know, it's kind of bad that we have so much technology because, like, you know, nuclear war, bombs, they kill so many more people, you know, so much quicker. So there are downsides to it, I guess, too. But I, I don't know. Like, I would probably take a, a quick, you know, death with a bomb over, you know, months of slugging through Russian winters and slowly dying of disease or starvation or freezing to death, whatever. You know, that's just miserable. So, uh, I know, I I guess it sound, <laughs> sounds weird to say this, but I'm almost grateful for, like, modern warfare. I'm not grateful for warfare, but, you know, I'm just kind of, if we're, if we're going to go to war, I'm just kind of grateful that we have better technology 
better health care, all of that stuff, to make it a little less miserable for the troops, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Napoleon was now in a very precarious situation. His army had just been obliterated, and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an opportunity to take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides, while Austria declared neutrality. Even Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. The war of the Sixth Coalition had begun. The coalition so are, forces had been reforming. So, where Pomeranians come from? The, the dogs? Yeah. The war of the Sixth Coalition had begun. The coalition forces had been reforming their armies, and they Stop were now pointing the much guns better. at yourself. And it's the weird. UK had also significantly amped up its financial aid to its continental allies. Their armies quickly advanced through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he called up over 100,000 new conscripts, mostly teenagers. He also put his factories into overdrive, and he was like, You, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse... I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me! I'm gonna be sick. As it turned out, Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics relied on speed, maneuverability, and destruction. When he took the fight to the Allies in 1813, he did defeat them and sent them running. But lacking cavalry, he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy. He needed horses. For the Allies, being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning. So both sides were like, hold up. Time out. The Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. But instead he agreed to a brief truce with the Austrians mediating between the two sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. Having had their terms rejected, Austria felt now they were justified in saying, well, we tried, and they joined the coalition. Okay, every okay everyone, look at us. The boys are back together. But Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, uh, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Uh, oh, uh, no, 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 no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run away. Genius. He's a genius. The plan was as follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, whoever he advanced on would avoid battle, allowing the others to sweep in from the sides and attack the French marshals guarding his flanks. Essentially, the plan was, don't try to fight Napoleon. And this plan worked tremendously. The Allies scored a number of victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand as the Allied oh, armies yeah. converged in on him from all sides. This is my favorite battle of the Epic History TV series was Leipzig. Uh, just because it was, it's like where everything basically came to a head. And it was, I think, the the... Even though Russia, I guess, was was probably con is considered like maybe the main turning point um, against Napoleon, and rightly so. Um, I feel like this was kind of like the beginning of the end of Napoleon, right here, or what really cemented the end. You know, um, he was really. I don't know. It just had kind of like that that epicness to it, you know, that I really that's. You know, it's, it's kind of, like, fun. Again, like, it's so weird. Like, I keep saying fun, and I was gonna say fun and warfare. You know, it's kind of fun, in a way, to, like, go back and and see how all of this went down in certain battles and in history. Like, for World War II, like, to me, uh, learning about D-Day, you know, it's such, it's such an epic, you know, thing. Or maybe for uh, the Russians or, you know... The Germans, like Stalingrad, is more meaningful to them. Uh, you know, just those like big epic battles and history that happen. It's kind of fun to go back and learn about them and kind of see how everything you know went down. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, not that that war is fun or <laughs> or anything. I don't want to like miscommunicate that. But uh, for me, uh, Leipzig is that in uh, in the, the Napoleonic Wars. From all sides, the stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle 
of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this battle is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. And so they did. When it became clear that Napoleon couldn't win, he ordered a retreat across the only bridge over the river. The Allies swarmed into the city, and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed. After. You got that? Yes, Colonel. I'm not five. I can comprehend time. Good. Wait. Did he say before or after? Well, fortune favors the bold. The bridge was blown early, and 30,000 French troops were stranded and captured. A disaster. And with that, the dominoes were beginning to come crashing down on Napoleon. In the south, an army under the British Duke of Wellington had been pushing the French out of Spain for the past few years, and were now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy, while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat, who Napoleon had made king of Naples, decided to switch sides. German states, many resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him, and the Confederation of the Rhine collapsed. Bernadotte invaded Denmark, and they were forced to join the coalition, while the Netherlands were liberated. You'd think Napoleon might have seen the writing on the wall, but he was Napoleon, and so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, he called up more conscripts to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, they all agreed that the ultimate aim was the deposition of Napoleon entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread out. His army was so small that he could move at lightning speed, and he used this to his advantage. In the famous Six Days campaign against Prussian General Blücher, he attacked from all directions and defeated Blücher's forces four times, only suffering a tenth of the casualties he inflicted. Even with his back completely to the wall, Napoleon was still Napoleon. Then he turned south to take on Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once, and wherever he wasn't, the Allies continued to push towards Paris. He made one last-ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off their communications, but Paris was in disarray, and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, hey guys, come on in. And so, they did. The city's defenders this. surrendered. This was a major point of confusion for me in the Epic History TV videos because I was like, why would Napoleon just leave a, a free path to Paris for the troops? Um, I mean, like, I did realize he was going to cut off their communications, but the uh, I think the thing that I missed in in the uh, Epic History TV thing was that um, the Allies thought that Paris was really heavily defended, and they actually weren't, um, which. Uh, oversimplified kind of like implied here very quickly though they didn't really give a whole lot of context for it but um, the uh, the general thought was that there were a bunch of French troops in Paris defending the city and when the actuality there were hardly any and Napoleon was hoping that the Allies would uh, believe that Paris was heavily defended and that's why he took the gamble to uh, go you know behind them and cut off their communications and just leave like a free path to Paris and I don't know like f I guess I understand why he did it he was he was just hoping that they wouldn't try to go to Paris you know there was nothing stopping them from doing it so in my mind it's like a huge gamble like you know, you're you're just uh, you're you're guessing that the allies are are just not going to go for it, you know, um, and then that just leaves that leaves Paris completely undefended, 
And I guess, like, he wouldn't have been able to hold them off anyway. I mean, his army was, as they said, a lot smaller. So even if he had stayed to defend Paris, it probably wouldn't have made a difference in the end. But, yeah. But this was, like... I, I just kind of, like, didn't really understand this whole plan when I was watching the History TV videos. And then you guys had to, like, explain it to me in the comments as, as to what actually was going on here. So, uh, yeah. Rendered. And as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris had fallen. Quick, marshals, gather your men. We're going to launch an assault on Paris. Where are my marshals? They all left and told me to give you this note. Napoleon's marshals had realized <laughs> what he hadn't. It was over. And they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate. And without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. Old King Louis XVI's brother would become the king of France. It was almost like the French Revolution had never even happened. But what will we do with Napoleon? We can't have a hyperactive 44-year-old menace running around reigniting revolutionary ideals and plotting his return. Well, why don't we send him... Mm, I don't know. There. The location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Allies must have been in stitches. See, like, they... okay, so Epic History TV did not go at all into Napoleon's exile, so I'm glad that they're going to touch on it here. I'll, le I'll at least get some idea for what happened. Um, I know he escaped from Elba eventually. I was under the impression that he was, like, sitting in a jail cell. I didn't realize that he was actually ruling over the island and, you know, got to live, I, I guess, luxuriously there. I seriously thought he was just, like, sitting in a jail cell somewhere in Elba, but obviously not, so... When they came up with that, when he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck. But it had gone out of date, so instead of a quick and painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. And off he went to exile. The deal that was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles, he was to receive a state pension from France, and he was able to receive many distinguished visitors, all eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure and introducing many legal and social reforms aimed at improving life on the island. Hey, Napoleon, just coming in to check on how it's all going. Holy smokes! But it wasn't <laughs> all good. For one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife, Josephine, and was deeply saddened. He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Francis had ordered a local count to seduce her so she would forget about Napoleon. Then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. But the biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. He had lived a thrilling life of adventure, fame, and glory. Now, he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean, and he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Hey, Napoleon, want to go back to France and reclaim your throne? I would, Pierre. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, pucker up, boyo. Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He basically had okay. kind of a leaving ceremony, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. He brought this with him whole, an This whole situation is so weird to me. So bizarre. Like, they exile- they want to get rid of Napoleon, they exiled him, but he's like living like a king, basically, in Elba. Uh, he still got all of this respect. His family is still, like, nobility with titles and stuff. And he could just, like, leave. It's so weird. Like, this whole thing is so weird to me. I don't know. Maybe it's just they did things differently back in those days. I mean, I guess maybe it, I guess it just shows that there was, even though he wreaked havoc on Europe, there, obviously, he still had a lot of respect from people. Because, I don't know, I feel feel like it's one of those situations where he would have been put in front of a firing squad and, and like, killed, you know? But, um, 
I don't know, I guess Napoleon's just like a different breed. I think of him as like a dictator in a way, um, but also not because he he just had a very different way, of, I guess, of like ruling. And as a lot of you guys have said, you know, introduced a lot of new reforms in Europe, improved infrastructure, like all of that stuff. So it was like he did a lot of good things too. Um, so I don't know. He's a... I guess he's just like a, a bit of a different historical figure, isn't he? Him an army of about a thousand men, and he began his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king, and at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. That's right, the king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. I know the economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace and we will definitely work as hard as we can to fix everything. Oh yeah, that's why we got rid of the king. As the Bourbon monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past, and the returning nobility seemed hellbent on regaining their lost privileges, the people weren't too happy. And so, Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem. I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Uh, Your Majesty, it seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined his side. Well. I'm off to Belgium. If you ever need a king again, be sure to let me know. As Napoleon continued his journey, the king had sent battalions of men to stop him, but they largely comprised of Napoleon's old soldiers, many unhappy with King Louis's military reforms. And so, when ordered to arrest him, they simply couldn't do it. In one famous incident, the troops began to cry out, Long live the emperor. When Napoleon reached Paris, with King Louis having fled, he entered unopposed to reclaim his throne. Napoleon was back from the dead. Okay, everyone, so crazy. now that we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure something like this can never happen again. What's that doing there? Hey, fellow monarchs. <laughs> this time, Napoleon promised he would be a mucho mucho good boy and not start any wars. But the Allied leaders were having none of it. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war, not on France, but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple empires declaring war on you as an individual, that's how you know you're a very naughty boy. The Allied powers began making plans to combine their forces and once again invade France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate and maybe he could hold on to his power. Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north, where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, and it was close. The British held the high ground and a number of key defensive buildings across the battlefield. After waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. French Marshal Ney launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. The British formed defensive square formations and they tore the French cavalry to shreds, while one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front Okay, so that, that photo was also shown in the Epic History TV Waterloo um, video. I did not see that guy with that expression on his face, so that's hilarious.
One guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line. And from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his Imperial Guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier begun to arrive, and now they were arriving in large numbers. And after the British held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, the French lines panicked, fearing they had been encircled, and they began to flee. The Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew he was defeated. He went to the British and said, can I please have a house near London? And the British replied, no. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote places they could think of, a tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean, St. Helena. Here, a deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as General, rather than calling him Emperor. His mail was censored, his visitors were vetted. There was almost no way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 British soldiers and two okay. ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. Wow. He had once been like, the most powerful... This is like Alcatraz almost. <laughs> they learned their lesson the first time. ...man alive. And images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost old. everything. And by the way, he was only 46. So maybe it's about time you, um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon fought one last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. And in this battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution, and then another one. Reaction to Napoleon's rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas I mean, and just look at this, like, okay, I know. <laughs> Looking at this map, Europe just looks like a mess compared to, uh, you know, what it is today with uh, established countries and stuff. But now, like, you know, I know, again, it's like one of those things, I know Epic History TV showed these maps and stuff, but I was, like, so focused on what was happening with Napoleon, I really did not pay that close of attention to the maps. But this one right here, um, like, I'm seeing now just how carved up Germany is between all of these different territories. So, and I know that this was also like referred to as the Holy Roman Empire, which I need to do a video on. I've been asked to do a video on that for like months now and I haven't done it yet. Um, so now I'm kind of like, guys, look, I'm slowly getting all of this information and it's slowly starting to sink in. I'm slowly getting all of these pieces and putting them together. So it just takes a bit. It takes me seeing multiple videos and, you know, multiple sources again to like, really start to get this stuff so uh yeah so i definitely see and i see the austrian hungary hungarian empire in the red down here taking up a huge i mean like it's not huge huge it's the size of a country i mean it's not that big it's not that much bigger than france or spain i feel like or the uk really based on, well based on the way it looks on this map i don't know um so yeah, and so it's just, again, like the, the pre-World War I map that I'm learning about now, it, it looks not quite this, I feel like some of the, the stuff is more unified around Germany, but um, it, it looks kind of similar to this too, so it's just different, like, the only, the only Europe prior to watching these videos that I was familiar with is the current map of Europe, basically and I didn't really have an understanding of how all of this was, you know? Because uh, I just not really ever studied it before in history. Um, I'm sure my history classes, you know, presented it at some point, um, you know, in school, but I just apparently just did not pay that, that much attention to it or I forgot it, so.
feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various so modern go back and a rule bit in here. places like Germany and Italy. Propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history, and his revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. There's still hope for Joe Biden, but the man remains somewhat of an enigma, I and we not. still aren't sure exactly what to make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, spreading equality wherever he went, or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch and restricting certain liberties? Was he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hellbent on bringing Europe to its knees? Or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing his power? Some things yes. will continue to be debated. Napoleon died at the age of 51, officially of stomach cancer, but some believe he may have been poisoned. The British buried him in a tin coffin inside a mahogany coffin, inside a lead coffin, inside another mahogany coffin. I guess this time, they wanted to make sure he stayed where they put him. In 1840, his remains were moved to Paris, where they now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said, but the memory that is left in the minds of men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. Oh, and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. All right, so I kind of like how uh, Oversimplified, you know, wrapped that up where they were kind of like, was he this or was he that? Um, I think the answer to all that is yes. He was probably all of those things. Um, I guess it just depends on how you look at it. Maybe what country you're from, how you view Napoleon, you know? Um, but I think, you know, it's... I think humans like to put things in either or categories. We like to compare things. We like to say this is better than that. Uh, it's just, I think, human nature to do that. But I think the reality is a lot grayer than that. It, it, reality is not either or usually reality is all of these things and you can be all of these things napoleon can be all of these things he can be a ruthless dictator he can also be the guy that um you know freed freed people from the monarchy um he can be the person that that destroyed cities and burned cities he could also be the person that introduced you know new infrastructure he he did all of those things so he's a very like gray figure i feel like in history and it's i think unfair to judge him one way or the other um you have to kind of like take into account everything that that he did so in that sense there are some good things that came out of him there are some bad things that came out of him as i think is the case for all humans we have good and bad sides to us you know so uh he just took it up <laughs> a thousand you know because he decided that he wanted to conquer Europe and so we got to see the good and bad in him on a very grand scale you know so uh yeah interesting again like I'm really glad you know oversimplified is you know the juvenile humor and stuff and it is you know not really like my brand of humor but um but I do like the way that they uh present things you know and I think there's something to that oversimplified way of presenting things because you get a lot of very clear-cut information that might get lost in a more, you know, detailed explanation of things like Epic History TV, which you would think would be the opposite, but honestly, like, the human brain can only take so much information at once, and when you've got it pouring in, you know, in, like I said, like that detail that Epic, that Epic History TV does, um, it's a lot harder to remember everything, but, you know, when you get a more just, like, simplified overview of stuff, uh, some things, some information will, will sink in that it wouldn't otherwise, you know? So, um, I, like I said, like, if you guys want to learn more, more about Napoleon, I think most people watching these videos already know, like, a lot about him, but if you're just, like, getting into Napoleon, like I am with all of this stuff, 
then highly recommend that you just you know watch a bunch of different resources on him because you're going to get different information based on what you watch and like i said that repetition of hearing it multiple times eventually you'll start remembering it you know and that's how that's how we learn so you can become an expert on anything by i think just applying that method you know learning from multiple resources reading seeing hearing stuff multiple times that's how you become an expert on a subject so uh don't feel bad like i did when i first started this i felt really stupid because i think a lot of people like i said that watch my videos are already experts in a lot of the stuff and so they're here like trying to help me learn down in the comments and stuff and I would occasionally get like a kind of like a rude or mean comment of like, I can't believe you don't know this stuff or they already said this, but you, you, you weren't paying attention or whatever. And it's, uh, you know, I kind of felt bad about myself, but now I realize that no, it's just the way the human brain works. Like it's impossible to remember every fact that is thrown at you in these videos. Um, that's why you've got to watch it multiple times. That's why you've got to watch multiple resources, like I said. Get it from multiple angles, uh, different viewpoints and stuff. And, and uh, you know, that's when you'll really, really start to learn this stuff. I mean, I'm way smarter. I'm still not that smart, you know, when it comes to Napoleon, because again, like, I'm a beginner with it, but I'm starting to, like, it's starting to make more sense to me now, you know? So, the more I watch about him, the more and more I'm remembering and learning and stuff. So, um, anyway, I guess, uh, I don't know why I went into all of that, but just to offer some word of encouragement, I guess I'm also excited about my progress in this too, because I realized just how much I actually did learn about Napoleon while watching, uh, these oversimplified videos. So anyway, I guess I'm kind of like excited for myself in my own learning journey with this that I actually know way more now than I did before I started Napoleon where I knew absolutely zero. So I can see my own progress. I'm kind of like proud of it in a way, <laughs> I guess. But um, again, like I said, there's so much for me to still learn. I'm not saying I'm an expert on Napoleon by any means, but uh, I don't know. There is some progress happening. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this, this series on Oversimplified. If you haven't watched the Epic History TV um, series on the Napoleonic Wars, I recommend you guys go do that next. And um, I'm going to be watching Sharp and uh, Waterloo eventually. Uh, looks like over on Patreon, I'm going to be watching the Sharp series if you guys are interested in any of that stuff. I'll probably post the uh, more abbreviated versions of the reactions to that on, on YouTube. Um, so, but the full version will be on uh, Patreon. So I've had a lot of people say, please watch Sharp because it's, a, I guess, a fictional depiction of the, the uh, Napoleonic Wars from maybe the British standpoint. I'm not sure exactly, but um, I'll be starting that next week over on Patreon. So anyway. If you guys are interested in that, you can check that out. Uh, the links to my social media, Patreon, Discord are in the uh, description of this video and in my pinned comment if you're interested in any of that stuff. Um, also like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. And we'll probably circle back to Napoleon at some point on this channel. I'm not going to completely ignore him. There are some videos uh, that I found on YouTube about him that I would like to kind of circle back and watch as well. So. With that in mind, stay tuned for all of that stuff. Also stay tuned for the World War One, where that's going to be like my next big uh, series on this channel is learning about World War One. So appreciate you guys watching. Stay tuned for that. And uh, Napoleon here and I will see you next time.